Happy Tuesday and happy December, everyone, and welcome to the last webinar of the uh, Portage Network webinar series for 2020, Building RDM Across an Institution, the UBC Library Advanced Research Computing Partnership. My name is Jennifer Abel. I am the training coordinator for Portage, and I'd like to acknowledge before I begin that I'm speaking to you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil Nation. Uh, in today's webinar, we're going to be look at, looking at how supporting research data through its entire life cycle requires a breadth of expertise that oftentimes spans across different departments within an institution, resulting in disparate sources of information and disjointed support for researchers. At the University of British Columbia, or UBC, the Library and Advanced Research Computing, or ARC, have been working towards a collaborative model of RDM support that aims to minimize researcher burden and maximize service quality. In this webinar, we'll discuss the history of the library art collaboration, sometimes sub teams within these departments, collaborative initiatives, challenges, and future aspirations and goals for RDM at UBC. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping things I'd like to go through with you. You have been muted automatically when you entered the room. This webinar is being recorded and the chat may be archived for those who are unable to attend. We encourage you to use the latest version of Zoom so that you have access to all of the features, including security updates. Please use the chat feature if you're having technical difficulties or have additional resources to share. And please use the Q&A option to ask questions of the presenters. Questions will be addressed at the end. You may also raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. Questions may be asked in English or French. We do have a code of conduct that we follow here in our Portage webinars, which you can find at the link on your screen or which will be shortly in the chat. Carl and the Portage Network are committed to providing a welcoming, safe and harassment-free environment for its staff, membership, committees and working groups, as well as for participants, speakers and organizers of Carl meetings and events. We don't tolerate harassment of any kind. And now a little bit about our presenters. Nick Rocklin is the Research Data Management Specialist in UBC's Advanced Research Computing Team. He's active in the Portage Network of RDM Professionals, chairing the Training Expert Group and the Institutional Tra Strategies Working Group, and is an active member of the Further User Experience and Training Group. Doug Brigham has been the Research Data Management Librarian at UBC Vancouver since 2020. He is the Administrator for UBC Space Within Dataverse at Scholars Portal, and provides support to researchers in many disciplines. He's a member of the Research Data Alliance. And Megan Meredith Lobe is the Digital Humanities and Social Sciences Analyst for UBC Advanced Research Computing Team. In addition, she serves on the Compute Canada Humanities and Social Sciences National Team. And if you were with us in our webinar on Compute Canada last week, you may recognize her from that. And now, UBC gang, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks, Jen. Um, I will do some screen sharing here. Okay, is everyone seeing the presentation? Yep. Yep, okay, great. So thank you all for coming. Um, like Jen said, we'll be talking about building RDM across the institution, uh, the UBC Library Advanced Research Computing Collaboration. So what What's it all about? What are we going to talk about today? So I'll talk a little bit about the background, how UBC Advanced Research Computing has been working with the library throughout our entire, um, the entire history of, of uh, the Advanced Research Computing team. We're, we're about five years old. Library is obviously several thousand, so they got us beat there. Um, we'll also talk about um, some of the current work um, that uh, we are doing together as um, a collaborative partnership between the library and ARC. Um, as I pass on to my colleagues, we'll talk a little bit more about um, future work, what we have planned. And then finally, in the last section, we're going to talk about things to consider. So things to consider around how you at your different institutions with your different types of um, research support ecosystems um, can start to build these kind of collaborations across your own institution. Um, thinking about how you can support research researchers throughout the entire research data lifecycle and thinking larger than, than just RDM in terms of, of um, 
your digital research data, but about all the different aspects of, of research and how we can support researchers across our institutions when sometimes that support can exist in many different places. So this is where I will hand off to my colleague, Nick. And Oh, is this a handoff, Megan? I think we're all just collaborating and then Jen will kindly share the link to this Padlet and we'll have people answer it. Absolutely. All right, yeah, and so just kind of getting a feel of, of who we're talking to, the portfolios that not only you work within, but maybe if you are working across portfolios, what that might look like. Um, it's also Tuesday morning, first day of December, if you just want to hang tight, that's also cool. Oh, got some friends out there. And so Megan, I think you're controlling the screen so you can actually scroll through each of those answers and see uh, the kinds of things that people are filling out. There we go. Yeah. Yes, I can. All right, yeah, so all the usual players. Yeah, definitely. This is great, great participation right off the bat. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Um, yeah, it looks like a lot of the people from the library or research offices, and um, you're working with a lot of the people that, that we have on our radar to work with. So it, it seems like we're quite aligned in this sense. Love it. I think we can probably jump back into the presentation now, All Megan. Right. But if people want to keep participating, that this can stay up and uh, we can absolutely revisit. Okay. Back to presentation. Your first one, so um, uh, to start out with, I'll give you a, we'll give you a little bit of background about what are the units we're talking about here. Um, so what is ARC? What is advanced research computing? Uh, so advanced research computing, the way we'd like to think about it, 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 researchers with really advanced research computing needs that involve things like big data, large computational power, modeling, um, visualization, machine learning, things that can't be handled by standard computing infrastructure. So any computing that you can't do on your laptop. Um, now digital research infrastructure is the, the infrastructures, the hardware, uh, the people, most importantly, I, I think the services, the platforms that support people who are doing advanced research computing. So in Nick and I's department, um, we really support a, a big ecosystem of digital research infrastructure. So we're the people. Our department um, supports a number of, of platforms and services for people to access those infrastructures. And the people we work with largely are those engaging in advanced research computing. Uh, our um, research specialist team, which Nick and I are part of, we're sort of the um, front lines, I suppose, researcher um, engagements um, with UBC ARC. We work with a number of different teams. Um, we have a systems team that looks after hardware. We have a data um, privacy and security team that helps people with special, special needs for their data. We have a platforms team that supports um, some of the software and services as part of our infrastructure. And our specialist team, which as you can see from this slide, comes from a very wide range of disciplines, humanities and social sciences, myself, life sciences, um, Nick, RDM specialist. Um, we have someone in oceanography who looks after 
data and wrangles data in so many amazing ways. We have a cloud specialist whose background is in health. So our team is, is very, very deep and broad within its disciplinary special specializations, um, which really helps, I think, the research specialist to engage researchers across all disciplines and to, to understand what the different needs are of researchers working across these disciplines. Uh, Doug? Thanks, Megan. So to talk a little bit about um, how research data management is positioned within the library, there are two groups um, principally that uh, carry out this function. One is the research data management team. And that team uh, was put together two or three years ago. It consists of about a dozen librarians from around the system, both campuses. Also, most of the members of the specialist team, I believe, join uh, the research data management team in the library when we uh, have sort of monthly meetings. It's important that we have uh, colleagues to work with directly uh, across the system because they reach out to a lot of different researchers in many different areas. So their own educational backgrounds are quite varied as they are in the specialist team, but also the areas, um, uh, the disciplines that they cover in the different branches. As I said, we have people on both campuses. So UBC, two campuses, we have UBC Vancouver and UBC Okanagan in Kelowna. And we have colleagues from both working on the team. One of the important functions of the team is that we provide some continuing education and updating and support for the librarians on the team who then also carry that information back to their home units and continue to work with the folks that, uh, that they work with and support. And there's quite a lot of interchange within the team back and forth um, as we do consultations with researchers around the system. I myself am positioned in the Research Commons. The Research Commons was also put together in the last two or three years. We have a space on a couple of floors in the Kerner Library. So we're there, uh, not so much today, but you know, who is? Um, the Research Commons is designed really as a, a multidisciplinary hub and we support research endeavors. We uh, work on partnerships with both researchers and other campus units, and we have strong, uh, serve a strong educational function as well. The Research Commons is, consists of a number of functional specialists. So there's myself, the RDM librarian. We have someone who's a GIS and map specialist. We have another colleague who is the data specialist and another colleague who is a digital humanities specialist. And all of us work with um, graduate students, some undergraduates and faculty uh, across the campus and, and both campuses to some extent on uh, matters that support their research. And it's all kinds of support. So there is instruction, there is technical support, there's helping them think through a project there's being written into grants, there's data deposit uh, after the fact, that kind of thing. We also have a team of graduate academic assistants. An another function, sorry, that the Research Commons supports is more traditional um, research and writing support around things like thesis formatting and citation management. So some sort of gold um, bibliographic instruction library support to graduate students. We have a digital scholarship lab, which is one of the ones the university has transitioned to online remote availability. That is some higher end computing workstations that allow people to do more complicated computing and also to spin up uh, sort of contained, compartmentalized, uh, virtualized machines as they need them. And we also have some teaching and workshop space that we use uh, directly in connection to research related activities. Okay. There we go. Okay, um, thank you. Thanks, Doug. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about um, how we've been working, uh, how ARC and the library have worked together over the last five years really um, in building this collaboration to where we are now. I'll then hand over to, to Doug and Nick to talk about some of the fabulous things that are going on at the moment. So um, as I mentioned, libraries have been around for thousands of years, as you all know. Um, ARC itself uh, kicked off really around 2015. And from the very beginning, um, we uh, had a number of different connections with the library, um, high level meetings with senior administration in the library, and also um, at the time Eugene Barsky and now Doug uh, were sort of a, not entirely a secondment, but worked very closely with ARC in ensuring that ARC services and library services around research data management in particular were, were really aligned and we were working together. So in terms of the people, we've always been quite, had that, that strong connection with the library between ARC and um, 
uh, and the library. Um, and we've also uh, engaged on a num in a number of different ways. So events, um, some which, which Nick and Doug will talk about that have happened recently. Um, in the past, uh, we've worked very closely with the GIS librarian um, and participated in the annual GIS day, either through presentations, um, et cetera. I myself have sat on a number of um, hiring committees to uh, help hire new librarians. Um, to ensure that um, uh, I could offer expertise, the expertise of, of the digital humanities um, into, into people coming into the library. Um, the research infrastructure, of course, uh, within the ecosystem of, of research, research data, of collecting, analyzing, and storing, and, and all of these things we all know very well about, very much about. Um, whereas ARC is uh, very much in the active collecting now and analyzing right now, um, we have always wanted to ensure that um, researchers take into account what they need to do after that point and, and how they can engage with the library. Um, on most of the projects that, that I've worked with as a, a digital humanities specialist, um, most of the time I consult jointly with someone from the library on a number of these projects to ensure that researchers understand how their data can best be managed, um, looked after, analyzed from beginning to, to end, if there ever really is an end to research, to research or research data. Um, there isn't in a lot of ways. And so all of these, all of these different connections through working with people, joint consultations, um, events that we've worked with together, and really ensuring as much as possible that the research infrastructure to support researchers, ARC now has a high performance computing cluster, and we've always been very connected. Uh, we're part of Compute Canada and have been very engaged in working with researchers um, through Compute Canada. Um, so the research infrastructure to ensure that people can access it across the entire institution. And really what a lot of the collaboration has been thus far with ARC and the library is really helping connect the dots for researchers. What do you need to do when you're planning your research, when you're, when you're carrying it out? How do you share? How do you preserve? How do you keep your data safe? Um, how do you ensure that it's, uh, you're applying fair principles to your data? And so this is a way the collaboration has really built up over the last five years between the two. There we go, and I will pass on to my colleagues now. Thanks, Megan. There's a question from Chantal Rip in the Q&A that I just want to answer quickly. Uh, Chantal asks if the Research Commons team is responsible for upskilling the librarians in the RDM team and who trains the librarians on the RDM team. So uh, the answer is, is yes, they are uh, in the sense that one of the functions the Research Commons has is to identify gaps in sort of baseline competencies and to help to bring those along. Now, many of those are angled towards faculty and graduate students, but that also equally extends to colleagues in the library. So yes, they are. Um, it's, it's not formal in the sense that we don't have a formal training program. And actually your question now prompts me to think maybe we should think about that for 2021. Um, that's not a bad idea. Uh, who's responsible for training the uh, librarians on the RDM team? It's sort of a group effort. Uh, it's me to lead that to some extent. So I chair that very often we have a guest speaker in, um, often that's somebody from ARC who comes in and talks about a particular area that they're working in. So we had some people in to talk about HPC. We've had people in to talk about cloud and things like that. And then we also sort of work together on some group learning, but maybe something, maybe designing a sort of a training program throughout the year for the librarians and the RDM team, as well as maybe refreshing the team too, wouldn't be a bad idea, so. Good question, Chantal. Thank you. One of the things that we've started to work on recently, the uh, specialist team and I together, is to relook at the uh, DMP assistant template uh, that we use at UBC. So at the present, UBC uses a single generic template. Uh, the content, and which is really principally the guidance in the template, uh, dates from about 2016, 2017, and sort of just needs a refresh. In some cases, there's a um, a sort of objective material refresh to the content. So new services are available at UBC, new guidance needs to be provided. Um, that's actually something I'm gonna do after this meeting today is put some of those changes in. So what we did is uh, I approached the ARC specialist team to see if they would be interested in going through um, the DMP assistant and looking at the guidance and doing some of that, uh, the refreshing with me. I'll put the changes in 
later on. In the course of looking at that, we began to think about, well, could we actually expand what the template does? Because one of the things that we hear is that there is um, a sort of information flow. I don't want to say a disconnect, but there isn't a bridge, say, between the DMP assistant and the systems the researchers use in developing uh, grant applications, submitting them for approval, ethics, that kind of thing. So we're having discussions with other folks around campus about how can we get the information to flow in a way that is effective and accurate and efficient for all parties. Researchers principally, because they're the ones who really need to build this out and then just trying to make their lives easier. Um, so we're going to look at that more carefully. Uh, we're going to put in some small changes now for December, and then we're going to bring other stakeholders on board. So the members of the RDM team, uh, they don't know this yet because that's for a January meeting. So uh, if they're watching, then great. We're going to bring you on board for this. Folks over at Ethics, we're actually meeting with them today. Other art teams as well, systems and platforms, bring them in as well beyond the specialists and start that up in January. That's a chance for us to really look at how we're using the DMP assistant, the platform, what possibilities it provides to us, and then really making sure that we're providing the best support to our researchers. So we're going to consider the template from the ground up next year. And next slide. All right, the RDM Fall Series 2020. This was, um, uh, Jeff, Dynamite, I look forward to that. Thank you, discipline specific templates coming. Excellent, see, it's on everybody's mind. Um, RDM Fall Series 2020, so late September, three weeks into just about, just after Thanksgiving, I guess we did this, and we held workshops four days a week. Initially, this was meant to be one of the series in the ARG summer schools that they held in uh, late July and August. There was just a kind of a timing and content development uh, horizon issue, so that's okay. We deferred that into the fall, so we got to sort of do things on our own stage. Um, we had I guess nine or 10 sessions in total, Mondays through Thursdays, they vary between about an hour and an hour and a half. We had two hour office hours that were key to each of the sessions from that week on the Friday. So we had the presenter, the presenters from those sessions in the office hours available for people. This was really um, a, a co-development partnership. So that's the UBC Library, the folks at ARC, my colleagues at the UBC Okanagan Library and the Center for Scholarly Communications at the Okanagan campus. And if anybody has seen any of the videos or attended any of the webinars, that feels very much like every morning for me in late September and early October when I had to do that exact spiel. I just don't have all the slides. So having a bit of a flashback here. We did fairly well with, with the turnout. We got 365 unique residents, uh, registrants and uh, they attended a total of 684 sessions. That's really exciting. Um, we're super pleased about that. We were targeting principally the UBC community. I know Nick sent some promotional material out to some national listservs, so we did get actually a number of non-UBC folks who came in, many of whom were probably on the webinar today. So that was uh, a big success. I think it has provided us with a good model to look at developing something in 2021, whether that's in the summer or again in the fall, maybe that's the new thing, the fall series, I don't know, but uh, we're really excited to uh, develop that again for next year. The materials, uh, the recordings are available on OSF until the end of this year, then they're gonna come down, but all the materials, the presentation slides and the data sets will all stay available on the OSF link there. All right, so I'm um, jumping in now and I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, this collaboration across UBC campuses that Doug was uh, talking about there in the RDM fall series because I think it provides good context on how RDM is actually built out across an institution. And so as um, I'm sure you probably know now, there are two campuses at UBC. The main campus is located in Vancouver and there's a newer campus in the Okanagan. Now as a reference point, this campus is 15 years old and we have about 20% of the undergraduate students that Vancouver has and about 10% of the graduate students and faculty of Vancouver. Now, I work on the Okanagan campus and when I first stepped into my position about a year and a half ago, I kind of had a balance in my priorities, that, that my main priority was to work with the ARC specialist team and with ARC in Vancouver and really push those endeavors forward and to be that point person for ARC on the Okanagan campus. But then I also had this priority of focusing on Okanagan specific initiatives and specifically around developing training and education for data and computational skills because 
that's just, we didn't have that in the Okanagan campus, right? It is a newer and developing campus. We, we have less people, less infrastructure than Vancouver, but that was really an opportunity to start building things from the ground up. And so prior to COVID, I was in conversations with librarians on the Okanagan campus about getting these workshops started. And you know, what workshop should we start with? How would a pilot project work? Let's get some money for some graduate students. And then COVID hit and it really stopped us in our tracks as I, as I think it did many people. But then, you know, as time kind of marched on a little bit, the dust settled, um, a few things kind of became apparent. And the first one was there, there wasn't money for new initiatives like that. And I think many people can relate to that. But on a more positive side, um, geography all of a sudden meant way less than it used to and collaboration was easier than ever and I've collaborated much more closely with the specialist team that I'm a part of and at ARC than I ever did before COVID and I think this virtual environment really allowed for the RDM fall series to be what it was and to allow that institutional collaboration so like like COVID's awful I'm not trying to make light of it but this new virtual world has really shifted my position and focusing more on not what we can do specifically at the Okanagan, but what we can do together across the institution. And just people in Vancouver have been super encouraging of that. And it's been awesome to work really across this institution. Uh, Megan, can you take your next slide, please? And so in all of this, and this is something that started in early spring, um, we started a working group with librarians from both campus. You know, Doug was there, it was the RDM librarian, and as well as myself. And, and we were looking at creating some web content. And, and we started with some materials that we were going to adapt specifically to a UBC context. And, and in going through these materials, we really came across these, these two really big questions that um, I think we're still trying to answer, but we're getting a lot closer than we were. And the first one was like, where's this content gonna live and who's gonna own it, right? That we do have a few different portfolios working together. And while like individually, none of us care where the content ends up or who owns it, we want it to be out there. There are departmental interests that, that do need to be considered and, and quite thoughtfully. But this kind of rolls into this next question that I think is, is a lot bigger and that's, we really discovered there's so many different web pages and websites across UBC that are very scattered and they hit on all of these different points of RDM. You know, things ranging from, from data retention policies to all the ethics stuff, privacy, security, data storage options, actually learning about RDM, the stuff that ARC does. And like, where do you start with that? Like, it just seemed like such an impossible task and where would this entry point be? And so in having these conversations, we, we really realized like, this extends beyond just ARC and the library, and we really need to start having this bigger picture planning and bringing other people in. Can you take me to the next slide, please, Megan? And so this is where we started reaching out. And the people that we reached out to most recently was ethics and realizing that they play a really prominent role in RDM. And they, they do serve a subset of research that does deal with data sensitivities, but the people that they serve, they get them right at the beginning of their research process. They have to go there. And because so much of what happens in that ethics application and in that consent form language dictates basically everything that can happen with that data, there's a huge value add for a DMP for that community. And so we reached out to behavioral ethics, uh, the boards both on the Okanagan and Vancouver campus. Um, clinical is a bit more complicated, so they're, they're on our hit list, but, but not quite yet. And we had the very vague message of, hey, we're dealing with RDM, we're interested in kind of collaborating, we're, we're in developing web content. Would you want to talk to us and see what a collaboration might look like? And they were super keen. We met up, we had this great first meeting. It was one of those ambitious con uh, conversations where just huge ideas are flying around, it's exciting. And then we got to the end of the meeting and it's like, well, we really didn't set up any action items or deliverables. Like, what happens next? And then someone floated the idea like, let's just set up monthly meetings. Regardless if we have action items or deliverables, let's just keep pushing this conversation forward and that'll eventually get us to where we need to go. And, and we've had a few of these meetings now and, and it really has and like, but they're fun conversations and just in, in this last meeting, we've kind of decided we should have a deliverable and it's going to be a mapping project of what all the web content will look like. And like I volunteered as a sacrificial lamb to create these documents that are gonna be shredded apart. And, I'll be honest, like these, these documents are a straight dog's breakfast, like they're not good. But the goal is really to start these conversations and to, to move it forward and just to be confident in producing material that you're not confident in, just because it is what needs to happen to move these forward. And uh, 
I'm actually talking to the group about it in a couple of hours. So, you know, fingers crossed it goes well. <laughs> yeah, Doug's nodding his head. He's probably got all these loaded comments for me. <laughs> Anyways, passing it back to you, Doug. Take us forward. <laughs> There we are. We're going forward. No, Nick, you know what? It's great. And I appreciate the work that you did going, um, going, uh, going first. I had a colleague years and years ago in the library who said that she always saw herself as the person who would, would write something up for people to throw mud at. And I thought, I don't entirely understand that. But you know what? As I get older, I understand that. So thank you. Um, the mud will be very light. It looks really good. So I think this is a good place to start, right? And, and that's, that's a going forward thing. So Martyr documents. Okay, fair enough. Right. It's like the Fox's Martyrs of the RDM World, Volume 3. Nice. Okay. Um, going forward. So we are considering um, building on the success of the RDM Data Horror Stories uh, sort of salon roundtable that Nick hosted. That was the one session I wasn't able to attend. And it wasn't recorded, so I literally have no idea what happened, even though I was plugging it for three weeks. But it sounds like it was a real success. Um, sort of talking about the, the interest that that generated around just hearing researchers talk about issues in their areas. It doesn't have to be a horror story. Um, 2020 has been a bit of a horror story. We'd like to think that 2021 will not be, so it's not all horror all the time. Um, we want to start to roll out maybe a monthly series starting in January, and we'll cover a number of different areas, different disciplines, some cross-disciplinary things, and just get some people in two, three, to just talk sort of, um, you know, in the researcher studio approach and, and try to figure out uh, how we might generate some interest in that and just bring people in to talk. Also talking a little bit about uh, starting to think about the 2021 summer school. So maybe we'll take the 2020 fall series, take some lessons learned from that, maybe compact some things, maybe bring in some new content and repackage that for delivery in the summer as part of the ARC summer school. So we'll start that thinking fairly early next year. Yeah, Nick, I'll kick it back to you. All right, yeah, and so just talking about where the, where the future uh, of this relationship with library arc and ethics is, and just, I, I think really it's just having these conversations and also understanding that other people should probably be brought in and just, I, I think it really is strategizing and, and having a plan and not focusing on, on making it happen next month, but looking at it as a year long process and really developing relationships and seeing how everybody not only could fit into it, but, but is willing to, to fit into it. And so I think that's really what we're gonna be talking about today and, and going forward for the foreseeable future. And Megan, DH work. Yes, so, um, need a mic. Yes, so um, the, the future of DH work um, between ARC and the library and others is, I think, a great example of how this a sort of collaboration between um, not just ARC and the library, but perhaps on your own institution, um, different research support units um, can work together. So uh, with digital humanities, um, what we're really trying to do is find who's doing digital humanities and where does that support gen usually live within an institution? I've done a lot of work on this in the past. Um, and now with the research commons and with the digital scholarship lab, it's very exciting because you now have something that, that starts to look like a, a physical place that can be associated with digital humanities work. Um, in a lot of institutions, the library is where digital humanities is. It's, it's not in the advanced research computing department, sadly. Um, that, that tends to turn off digital humanists sometimes. Um, it's in the library. And so we're working very, I'm working very closely with the digital scholarship librarian in the library to say, how can we leverage the infrastructure support within ARC in terms of accessing the national um, platform with the physical space, the training opportunities um, and the expertise within the library. And we're also working very closely with the Public Humanities Hub, which is um, a vice president uh, research funded initiative that sits within the Faculty of Arts. And so, and within that, we're also working very closely with the IT support group within the Faculty of Arts, Arts ISIT. So we're bringing together um, centralized units such as the VPRI and ARC and the library and, um, and researchers, faculty, uh, researchers within the faculties, IT support within the faculties, liaison librarians. And um, what we're working on right now and what we'll be working on over the next couple of months is putting together um, a, just a survey of what sort of digital tools are people using in the humanities and try and really map out for our researchers where the support is. 
And sometimes that kind of work can be the most valuable way of collaborating. It's just sitting down with people from these different support units, as Nick said, and saying, what do you do? What, what, do you, what do you do? How can what you do and what you do and what you do come together to help this person do what they need to do? Because um, ultimately what we want to do is we want to get research done. We want people to, to build new knowledge, um, to support them in learning and in doing their research. And sometimes in order to support our researchers, we all need to sit down and look at what we do and what everyone else is doing. And again, it's that connecting the dots. Um, and because digital humanities at UBC, uh, Vancouver in particular, UBC Okanagan has an amazing digital humanities program, it's incredible. Uh, UBC Vancouver, it's a little more disjointed. And so we have to work a little bit harder in bringing all these things together um, and finding out where that support is. So I think the future of DH work as we go forward with our collaboration with the uh, research commons and with the faculties and with the IT support is, is a great example of how these collaborations can really help um, build capacity within an institution for better support. And second Padlet. Find that. And Jen has kindly put it into the chat box. Um, there's also a question that had come up. And the question is, how many people can join in those monthly meetings? And um, if, if I'm reading that correctly, it's the monthly meetings that we are having with, with ARC, the Library of Ethics. Um, well, my Zoom room caps out at 300, so it would probably be 300. But um, I, I, I don't know. I think I, wherever a reasonable amount, I think. I think that's really where the discussion is and, and how we, we are going to expand out. But um, again, noting that that ethics really does get people right at the beginning and, and is something that people have to visit, I, I would think that the next partner might be someone like Office of Research Services who deal with the funding right at the beginning. Um, there's a lot of stuff that IT are doing, but um, they have so many different departments within IT. It would be an interesting place to start, but um, I, I think it, it, it would be purposeful growth. And, and so I don't really have the answer to that, but I, I have thoughts about where it could go. And I'm sure Doug does and the rest of the group would as well. Just to, to build on what you said, Nick, um, Building collaborations with offices of research services is huge because that, that tends to be the first group that gets emailed when somebody's thinking about thinking about maybe applying for something now or in the future. Um, ARC in particular works very closely with our what, what's called our institutional programs office here at UBC and they work, uh, they handle CFI grants and we work very closely with them. So we tend to see researchers right at the very beginning. Um, and it really helps to kind of make sure that these things are, are baked into the proposals from the very beginning. Um, and uh, re yes, the grant support groups are definitely your friends. Um, liaison librarians are my personal favorite because they know everybody and they know everything that's going on in their, in their group. They know who the researchers are um, and they know what they're doing. They're excellent people to, to, to work with. Um, because they can tend to, so, oh, I know somebody is doing something like this. It's great. So we have a couple more questions in here. I'm, I'm going to be the question deliverer, I suppose, pseudo role. Um, so it's, uh, the question is, what language are you using to speak to faculty? And that they've found in a survey that people didn't know what was meant by digital scholarship, but because the survey was across disciplines, we didn't want to specifically use digital humanities. Um, I think, Megan, this sounds like it's, um, geared towards you, is there any language that you found as, as being successful? Yes, <clears throat> it's the language whoever you're speaking to, which is a bit of a vague answer. Um, so uh, this is where getting to know people helps um, and where, especially within the research specialist team at ARC, having such a huge disciplinary uh, scope really helps because all of us come from different disciplines within the specialist and we all speak very different languages. Um, to research. Um, I am not a personal fan of the term digital humanities. To admit that to a large group is difficult um, because I, I think it can exclude some people who are doing digital work 
and they're in a humanities field but wouldn't consider themselves to be digital humanists. So I like to start these conversations rather than bringing up loaded terms like digital scholarship or you're doing digital this, you're doing digital that. I like to just ask people, what are you doing? Um, what do you wanna know? What's your research question? And then get them talking. And once they start talking to you about what they're doing and what they wanna know, which is always the most important thing, then you can start to, I, I think, understand the language that, 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 that they want you to use to talk about what they're doing. So if somebody says, well, I'm doing a digital humanities project and blah, 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 then you can start out, then I would start out saying, okay, digital humanities, this, this. Um, if somebody's saying, well, I'm working on these novels and I would like to do X, Y, and Z, then it's, it's more, okay, so this is what you want to know. Let's start with that. Um, I always try and start with the research question and have a researcher articulate that to me in whatever language they use to talk about their own research and then adapt that um, in order to talk about the particular support they need. Sometimes they may not need digital support. Um, then that's okay too. I still like books. Um, I totally get it. Uh, so that, that is a, a, a long winded way of saying Talk to the, find out what language the researcher is using and, and build on that. All right, awesome answer. Uh, we have one more question. Um, I think this is asking about the monthly meeting. Is it an open in, uh, invitation? I, I think, right, like we'd plan this as something that was mapping UBC specific services, but like now that you say this, like it would be cool to have a group that, that did meet like that to discuss. Like I know Portage has those water cooler talks, but um, if there's any ideas about kind of a more open community to just talk about how we can map within institutions and across institutions, um, I think that sounds like a cool idea. Anybody want to add to that? Or? No, I, I, I like it. Uh, one of the, the other jobs that I work uh, on the side is for Copal in the share print world. And we're starting, uh, we're sort of facilitating some water cooler discussions around um, share print uh, program officers like myself and other people who are interested in that on the collection side. And that's been quite productive. We've had a couple. So maybe that's that's a way to go, Nick. I like that. So just to open, maybe there's a topic for the day. Everybody just comes and talks. It's very free flowing. Kind of like that. Yes, um, I passed the question off, but if, if you would like to email any of us and, and talk about setting something like this up, you're talking to an eager group, and so um, and we'd be supportive. Um, just looking at these answers, people wrote some very detailed stuff. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, there, there are some concerns about those types of things. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm just reading through it. Yes. Yes, the tri-agencies policy. Awesome. <laughs> and maybe we can also export some of these answers that people put in the padlets to, to the shared materials for this presentation, because I, I do think mm -hmm. that there is some, some great ideas in those roadblocks that um, we probably shouldn't spend too much time on now, but I definitely do think have, have merit. Absolutely. Okay, move back to presentation. There we are. Okay, so for the last bit here, um, we're going to talk about some things to consider at your institution um, when you're seeking to build these kind of these kind of collaborations between your unit, the library, other research support units. So we'll sort of this is this is meant to be kind of a roundtable between um, Doug and Nick and myself, where we'll kind of um, talk about our own feelings on these questions and what we've learned in our time. Please do feel free, ask questions, throw things at us. We're, we we're really would like this to be a, an open discussion with everyone. Um, so the first thing that, um, that you should all consider when building these types of collaborations, spend the time talking and exploring. And, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about who's doing what, where are they doing it? Who's supporting research in what way? Um, this is this is most of what I do at UBC because it's such a massive institution and and quite siloed in its own its own way of um, you know learning learning who's doing what um, knock on doors send email well don't knock on doors goodness um, send emails and invite people to Zoom chats um, and just figure out where this kind of support is hiding. Um, 
And Nick and Doug, I want to hand off to you guys now to talk a little bit about um, how do you both go about exploring? What, what is your favorite way of exploring um, new ways of engagement? Doug, you can go first. So that one's been a little bit, um, that's a bit tricky for me. I, I started doing this work. I, I've been at UBC for a long time, but I started doing RDM work really at the beginning of March and had literally about eight days in the office until we all went home. So this has been an all virtual year. That's just added um, um, an extra layer uh, of, of a, a sort of a, a spice to the change in, in work this year. Um, exploring it is, I mean, there's, there's a lot of information available online. So because I tend to be more of a structural guy, I was looking more at things like research groups, who to contact, trying to get in to talk to groups of people, um, trying to find that balance between very personal one-on-one -on -one connections and then some sort of medium-sized group like uh, research hubs or clusters or labs, and then just trying to make connections and, and bring people on board with the kinds of services that we offer. So exploring that, that's actually something else I have to get into uh, in 2021 because I, has, I was hesitant this year, not knowing as much about the area. So that was just an interesting position to be in. And I think next year um, will be a lot more sort of exploring and connecting with people at that individual and that group level. Nick? Um, yeah, it's the same thing, but from a different perspective, just, just just being part of ARC and not having a tremendously strong HPC background, a lot of my exploring is is this world of advanced research computing and really seeing how it really does so much connect to RDM and to that research software bit that we keep talking about and, and finding the, those gaps in connections, not so much gaps in services, but that these conversations aren't happening with people who are doing very similar things. And so it, it's given me a unique perspective as a librarian to be in this other world and understanding that we, they really need to be brought more closely together. And just what Megan was saying, like doing doing the virtual knock on doors, I send a lot of emails to people I don't know and just, just to see what they're doing. And um, just to repeat this again, I think the concept of Jen's martyr document, the sacrificial lamb, like that, that type of thing is tremendously important to, to move things forward. And, and just, I, I think people are very understanding of that. And, you know, like there's, there's, it's vulnerable. Like you feel a bit embarrassed to submit something like that, but, it, but it is tremendously helpful. And I think people appreciate it. And, and looking at this briefly from the, from the, the perspective of somebody who has a, a disciplinary sort of specialization with an arc, um, it's a little easier in a way because I sort of, I, I target um, faculty members whom I know are doing specific kind of work um, at UBC and also nationally. Uh, so it's a little harder. Well, it's much harder, I think, with for Nick and Doug because you've got a, you're kind of serving everyone. Um, whereas I'm sort of looking after a, a more, a smaller sort of subset of researchers. Um, but that those researchers tend not to do advanced research computing either in a, in a traditional sort of a sense. And so you have to kind of think differently about, um, okay, how can advanced research computing support this group that isn't really doing advanced research computing in the same way that other groups are. So spending time sort of talking and, and thinking about how I articulate what, what we do to researchers who might initially go, eh. Um, is also a challenge, but it's definitely worth doing and, and you meet so many more interesting people and find new and interesting ways to support them. I, uh, spend the time mapping services. This, this again is all part and parcel of the who's doing what, where, and how can, uh, how can you at your institution, especially if you feel like it's an institution where everybody's working in their own little silos, um, how can you how can you find this stuff out? Mapping services, mapping it out, just getting a piece of paper and writing it down who's doing what, where is the help? Um, get a picture of the research data lifecycle from anywhere on Google, and start looking at each individual sort of node within that within that messy diagram and say, okay, who is really researchers collecting data? Where can they? get the data? How do they even know to get data? Where can they help get help on the planning? Um, so mapping services is, is incredibly important. Um, Nick, you, uh, you're working on, on a, something like this kind of right now in terms of a, a sort of a needs assessment um, work that, that is really pushing you to have to think through all these, a mapping exercise 
like this as well. Um, are there any things that, that have come up in that work that might be interesting? Yeah, definitely. And like, I, I think there, there's still fairly incomplete thoughts. And, and I think the, the first step really is who does what? And that, that's a really great place to start. But I think in, in really looking at functional mapping, you have to push past that and think about how are researchers engaging with it? When and how are they finding this content? Because everything is virtual now, right? There's not like these storefront offices that you can go to. And, and I think really with, with RDM services, when you discover them, maybe you have an instructor or a colleague who tells you about it, but a lot of these websites are really stuck in their own little isolated bubble. And, and so it, it's really thinking about research or discovery, trying to get them at the beginning and, and really focusing on their experience and just, you know, they, they go to a page very quickly for a specific link. If it's not there, they'll move. And so trying to be very purposeful, not only with who does what, but dealing with people who have a tremendous urgency with time and how you can promote services that they might not initially see value in that, that are valuable. Definitely don't have the answers to this, but that's where kind of my train of thought is with this. Great, so put you on the spot there a bit. Um, Doug, do you want to throw anything out? No, I, I think what Nick is, is saying is right, and I think it is about understanding the services, where the information is. But then I think also, if you want to move towards uh, a more structured approach to delivering the information, you have to put it somewhere people are A, going to find it, or B, care about it. So always for me, there is the so what button, and I am always pressing the so what button. Right, all the time. I hope nobody in this presentation is listening to me talking, they're pressing the so what button. Um, that's important because people have to see a reason to think about what you want them to think about. They're very, very busy thinking about a million other things. So you have to sell them on the value of this and it has to connect with them. And that's back to Megan's comments about using their language. So I'm drawing out a so what button on my page right now. Thank you. And uh, yes, um, connecting with disciplinary librarians. Um, they know who's doing what, they know the researchers. Um, connecting with the disciplinary librarians is a huge step forward because you will get, it, they will help you really get into the weeds of what sort of research is being done in the, in the departments, uh, not so much, not even at the faculty level, but right down in, in the departments. Um, and once again, we're back to the who's doing what. It's really an exploration um, to try to find the connections. Um, Nick and Doug, as, as you both have library backgrounds, um, the, the, I'm always gate crashing library meetings, but you guys are the real thing. Um, do you have any particular advice for people on the best way to connect with disciplinary librarians or how, how you can build up that relationship with them? I'll start with Doug because I picked on Nick the first time. So again, I think that's going to be something I have to pick up more um, next year. My reason for saying that is that I've worked with most of the disciplinary librarians at certainly UBC Vancouver, in some cases for the better part of 25 years. So we know each other pretty well. Um, you make some assumptions about how people work or what their interests are. I think you have to restart that conversation because I'm somebody who's not new in the organization, but I am very new to the work. So I have to restart that. 2020 was all about me finding my feet. And so 2021 is now about having found them a little bit, getting out there with that. So I think really just getting in touch with the contacts that you have. Disciplinary librarians, I would say in reverse, sometimes you got to get up a little bit out of your disciplines, bring the knowledge with you, but don't stay in your silo. Um, I think there's been a little bit of resistance to, you know, well, what's the point of the RDM stuff anyway? I deal with my researchers. They're my guys. I'm their guy. That's it. But I think there are some larger conversations to have. There's been a bit of that. So I think we need to sort of um, unpack that and, and make that work a little bit better. And then really have that two-way flow. So we're, we're all on the same team, right? There aren't teams. So just a specialist team. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going with it. Like, I, I think connect with disciplinary librarians, but provide a venue for them to connect with each other, right? And just kind of bringing everybody to the table because I obviously that there's differences between humanities and bioinformatics, but I think that there are things that can be learned from those processes and that hearing somebody's research methodologies in a different discipline can really boost that aha moment. And I think just as things go forward, the promotion of interdisciplinary research is really exciting. And so I, I think that there's really an opportunity for that. And I'm not saying RDM is necessarily the way to connect this, but I, I think it might be. Hmm. 
I, I completely agree. It's, it's, it's definitely one thing that people can agree on that they have data and something needs to be done with it. <coughs> um, even if how they define data is different. I, I recall an anecdote, um, having a meeting with um, a, a liaison library for um, uh, art history department for a create or a creative um, art department and saying, well, my researchers don't think they have data. And it was, it was soon after I started at UBC and it was very eye-opening sort of, okay, they're painting pictures. They don't consider that to be research data. Okay, I need to think differently about how I'm talking about what I'm doing. Um, because even though I would see that as you're creating a, a, an output, a creative output is, is data in its own way, I need to talk about it differently. Um, and, and I need to talk about it differently with your researchers. And that was a, that was a great eye-opener um, to, to how I really had more conversations that needed to happen. And I, I really appreciated having that, having that conversation. And so just being conscious of time, we have two questions in the questions box. So we can try to answer those first and then maybe get to this last point. But um, the first question is, have you come up to any researcher with huge or significant hesitations to take up an institutional RDM strategy? And can you speak to their concerns? And so um, personally, I, I, talking to a researcher about the institutional RDM strategy is kind of, there's a sales pitch to RDM. Um, I had someone laugh at me when I first started this job and I was trying to get them to, to do a DMP that they just didn't want to do it. They, they saw it as taking up more time and that they, they had all the grants and their CV was what it was. And there is that. <laughs> and I've said this before, like it's, um, I, I think graduate students or early career researchers are a bit more open to this type of thing because they're not indoctrinated in their processes. And so I, I would say that's the concern. It's generally people who are well-established who have you know, carved out this career without this stuff and they, they really don't see the value add. I don't know if you two want to add to that. I was saying if the researcher doesn't consider their outputs to be data, then, then <laughs> engaging in research data management can be tricky as well. Um, and yes, I've, I've, again, had that conversation a couple of times. Um, so that's where we have to think, uh, um, make sure we're using the same language as the researcher when in order to in order to talk about what it is you want to do and and why rdm is important and why you should engage in it use their use their language um and have a little laugh with them yes. if that's all you can do <laughs> laughter is huge and so i have one last question and jug i think this is about the rdm group it's talking was there any reservation from disciplinary librarians to take on more, like that upskilling to be proficient in RDM? And really, what was the so what to bring them on board? So the, the genesis of the RDM team, I think, was that Eugene Barsky was going on leave uh, for a while. And so they needed to figure out how they would begin to put a team together to spread out and provide some RDM support across the institution. So at least the core people were people who were self-identified as being interested um, in their professional work and in their areas. So the, the so what to bring them on board was this was a chance for them to learn about how we are connecting with researchers, connecting also into ARC and trying to figure out how we're supporting people in their disciplines. So they sort of self-identified for that. I think coming up this year, there probably is a larger conversation about getting everybody else on board. Um, I was going to say to Megan, maybe one way to think about things is if you can put it on your CV, we want to talk to you because it probably has an RDM component in some way. Right, even if it doesn't have a heavy data or a computing component. So that's like, if you can track it, then we probably need to talk about it. So, uh, and I think it, we're gonna have that conversation with librarians as well in the coming year. Absolutely. And we are getting very close to time here. Um, so our final point is um, managers, supervisors, if you have direct reports who are supporting research in any way, help them, enable them to do this. It is, and, and this, is, this is us sort of, I suppose, probably preaching to the converted, but um, allowing, allowing time and space for this kind of exploration um, beyond perhaps what is mandated in someone's job description is, is, is hugely important. And it will benefit whatever sort of unit you're with if it supports research. Um, knowing more about the research ecosystem at your own institution will 
will benefit. Um, we have seen this through ARC um, uh, over the years and through a numbers of different um, collaborations that, that I know I personally have had across units. Um, it is beneficial and, and it is something that um, adds to our role and helps us be better at what we do, which is ultimately supporting research. Nick, Doug, if you want to add anything there. No, I, I think you no. covered it. Like, yeah, uh, allow for this. Give them time. Yeah, definitely. You, you almost, given the work that we do, you almost cannot lose by allowing these conversations and by encouraging them. So provide support. Uh, let people follow their hearts a little bit. They're interested in it. They're self-directed professionals. Help them do that. There are competing institutional priorities, and we all have local situations on the ground that we need to deal with. But you cannot lose by supporting these discussions. Also, consider hiring unusual positions. It's unusual for a librarian to be an ARC. If you look at the specialist team, we are very unusual globally in our backgrounds and working with ARC and just, you know, I'm also on the Okanagan campus and I think by situating things in, in unique ways, you will get unique results. Absolutely. And finally, thank you all so much for coming, for listening to us. We apologize for going slightly over time. I think that's probably my fault. Um, and any other questions, discussions, etc., please reach out to any or all of us, we'd be delighted to speak with you. Thank you all so much, Megan and Doug and Nick. That was a, a, a great presentation, a great discussion. I hardly had to do anything, so I was just standing and enjoying. It was great. Um, Thanks to all of you who, who came and joined us today. And, and I'd like to say as well, thanks to all of our presenters and our audiences over this past year. Uh, you've helped make this series something useful for the Canadian RDM community. Um, and we really hope that we'll be able to continue it going forward in 20, 2021. We will be continuing going, it going forward in 2021. And we hope that we'll be able to start having some more in-person conversations as well. Uh, the slides for this presentation and the link to the video will be going out in a couple of days. Um, so you'll get to watch it again and, and get back into all those great ideas. And in the meantime, everyone, uh, stay safe, stay sane, be kind to each other, and we will uh, see you on the other side. <laughs>